Um, by the way, uh, I don't think we need to record the social half hour. Um, so, yeah, we can go ahead and turn that off for just a little bit, just so that everybody can just... Um, for some of you who weren't around earlier, uh, my name is Shawnee Williams, and I am the Assistant Programming Director for SLA. Uh, this evening, I have the pleasure of introducing Melanie Seller, co-founder of the uh, nonprofit organization Librarians Without Borders, and adjunct professor at SJSU High School. This past summer semester, I had the opportunity to uh, take Melanie's international librarianship class and found out everything I knew about IL was pretty much incorrect. Um, no, but seriously, I, I learned a lot about uh, what it means to practice IL, and I also had the opportunity to interview someone working in the field. Uh, it was a very informative and fun class, and I hope everyone gets the opportunity uh, to take a course by her. Um, SLA programming decided to focus on Compo International Librarianship tonight because it is still new to the iSchool as a competency. And so, so we wanted to give people the opportunity to learn more about the topic and ask questions. So if you have any questions, as stated earlier, um, throughout the presentation, um, please type it in the chat box. And uh, we'll keep an eye out for it. And we'll um, let Melanie know. And hopefully at the end, she'll you know, be able to answer as many as possible. Also, uh, we stated this before, but uh, we're using the hashtag international librarianship um, if you want to follow along on Twitter. Um, and without further ado, Melanie Seller. Hi, Shanice. Can everyone hear me OK? Yes, OK, great. I'm just going to turn my video on for a, just for a little bit for a moment, just so that you can see my face. And then I'll turn it back off, <laughs> just because I like to just introduce myself. Hi, nice to meet everyone. It's great chatting with you in the, the chat box so far, and interesting to hear about um, that a lot of you are still trying to find this sort of evidence or inroads into uh, finding uh, into internationalizing your portfolio. So um, hopefully throughout the talk you might get some ideas. Um, and maybe you already have some evidence that might work with you. It just hasn't occurred to you that that might qualify. So um, it's interesting to hear about maybe the, 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 the state of the art. I mean, this is a small sample of, of, of how and whether international competency has been incorporated into your courses because about three years ago I gave a talk at the iSchool. So they have these professional development webinars that every semester we have to take at least one of them. So I gave one on how to internationalize your course um, for the faculty because it was brand new for them. And the faculty were saying, how do I do this? You know, I have a course on cataloging or I have this or that. And so, and how do I actually internationalize my course? So it was three years ago that I did that. Um, I'm not sure how far along it's come. It's sounding like it's sounding like that it isn't permeated as as to the to the depth or breadth that I might have thought. So I appreciate hearing you guys um, uh, chat about that. Um, and I'm glad to be able to come full circle and uh, talk to students now about what it means to do international librarianship. So I've done the faculty. Maybe I have to go back and read the talk. <laughs> should talk to Sandy and Linda. And now I will uh, have the opportunity to talk with you guys. So a lot of what um, is in this presentation is kind of like I'm going through one of my introductory lectures for my courses at high speed. Um, so just to get some of these ideas out there and also drawing upon the article that you can see at the bottom of the title slide. So you could also download that if you are thinking that maybe you can use this presentation um, and a write-up as a piece of evidence, maybe also bringing an article in, you might find that helpful as well. So that's something that I'll be drawing on throughout. So I guess I can change myself, can't I, because I'm moderator? Yes, I am. So and we're going to cover, these are roughly the, the topics I'm covering tonight is introducing what library, uh, 
<laughs> just kidding, made those comments. Comment. What is international librarianship? Why do we do it? How do we do it? And who is doing it? Because it's a pretty nebulous term. I mean, at first glance, uh, anything could be international. Talking to a colleague across the border, collecting materials from someone, um, going to a conference where maybe somebody from uh, another country is presenting. So it can be, it can seem um, really ill-defined, but in fact, we can draw some sharp boundaries around the term international librarianship, and there are things that are more prototypical and things that are less prototypical, and we'll have a look at that. Um, I began teaching, yeah, I began teaching a couple of years ago at the high school, maybe three years ago, I think largely in part of Competencio. Um, I was working for librarians, I found the Librarians Without Borders, the high school reached out to me just to get some ideas about um, partnering and how we're going to work together. And now I teach the International and Comparative Librarianship course, which uh, Shanice took and survived. <laughs> I've heard that, well, I've heard this, that can be, my courses can be tough, but students always come out the other side and they're, <laughs> they're always very thankful for it. They, and I get a lot of comments that it's a, it's, it feels like a real graduate course. So way to go, I'm glad Shanice that, uh, that you appreciated the course. And I've also been teaching a um, project-based learning course. So I'm teaching that right now. It's a two-unit course. and It's focused on Guatemala and the community partner that we work with. And the, the students right now in my course are doing like hands-on projects in support of the community. So it's pretty cool. Um, so I came on board in support of this particular competency, the core competency O, right, which is identify ways. By the end of your, your time with San Jose State, you should be able to identify ways in which information professionals can contribute to cultural, economic, educational, and social well-being of our global communities. As I like to say, it's aka, it's the international competency. So you should be able to, to be acting upon and doing international things as an information professional. <clears throat> Oh, let's go back to the previous slide for a second. But that, um, it can be really confusing still to figure out the boundaries around that. And international librarianship is an, is an actual field within our profession. But it's a pretty, it's a relatively small field. It had a lot of vigor in publishing in the 70s and 80s, sort of like post-colonialism. There's a flurry of activity. It's a really good thing. Let's look at post-colonial libraries and what colonialism did to libraries and talk about this. So there's a lot of publishing then. And it sort of has kind of not really developed greatly beyond that. And um, it's... It's, there's, a, there's, oh, there's not a lot of scholars doing international librarianship. I think in large part because it's a hard thing to do. I mean, it's, it requires more resources and more networking and partnership, you know, partnerships in order to pull, pull that off. So when we are encouraging, and, and everybody, like every higher educational institution right now, is talking about internationalizing the students, the curriculum, the everything, I mean, we got to look at what does that actually mean to internationalize. As we go out and we're trying to internationalize our curriculum and change and asking students to collect experiences, uh, evidence, uh, in alignment with that, like we need to talk about and try and put some boundaries over what we actually mean by that. And I think that's, you know, pretty important to building our curriculum, for example. The definition that I like to use are, is the one that you can see here, and Shanice will remember very well, let me look at my notes, that um, I'm a big fan of, there's an international librarianship scholar called Peter Lord, one of the few and very prolific scholars in the field. He's an LIS professor. Um, at a university in South Africa, and he publishes a lot in international librarianship. He's an international librarianship practitioner, and he's a scholar in the field. So this is a definition that really um, works, for, works for me, which is that international librarianship is a field of study rather than a scientific discipline which promotes, establish, develops, and evaluates library and allied services and librarianship globally. It's a field of study. It's doing things. Um, it's not an actual scientific discipline. The activities are conducted in a relationship among or between parties at various levels, ranging from a single individual to a government, and these parties are located in two or more nations. There has to be reciprocity, exchange, and cooperation two-way for it to, to really qualify 
as, as international librarianship. And this is my, my innovation at the end to Laura's definition is these parties have significant librarian representation. In order to be doing international librarianship, there has to be librarians. And I think it's important to include that point because otherwise, um, thank you, Mary, for including that. Otherwise, you know, you might think of Better World Books or uh, book donation projects as being interna uh, international librarianship. Um, those are charitable organizations and they do good work, but they are not supporting and building the librarian profession and libraries globally. So there has to be librarians there, and I think we have to, I always say in my class, we have to have a very flexible definition as a librarian because a lot of places in the world a lot of countries in the world don't have MIS programs or it isn't a requirement to be a librarian. So I think as long as you are identifying, self-identifying as a librarian and trying to draw upon and contribute to the profession, then I think that you're a librarian. So this is the definition of international librarianship that, that I adopt and use in my class, in my courses. Um, so, one of the things that you guys will find when you're doing research um, international librarianship, if you, if you were to go into the LIS databases and, and, and search on that, is that there are a lot of descriptive study. There are a lot of um, uh, books that are compilations of chapters on, on say, interna international in ILL in the Philippines or, you know, well, you can see some examples here. University libraries in West Africa, public libraries in Nigeria. And they're largely descriptive. So they're not really trying to, like, improve upon the profession or to derive any great explanation or insights or, or, or theory, if you will. They're purely descriptive, and they have this kind of foreign element to it, the study of others, I like to say. Um, but Lord believes, and, and I believe this as well, that to, to really the pinnacle of international librarianship is that there has to be an international dimension in terms of the relationship. It's a field of activity, remember, it's there are rela real relationships with, it, with, with varying degrees of formality. Not They don't all have to have written agreements, but there there is a real relationship, there is reciprocity. So what we really like to see are the work along this line in support of international librarianship, where there is this dimension in there, like colonialism and the development of libraries and archives in French into China, like how colonial colonialism impacted colonies. Like, this is interesting. This is across borders. This is contributing to our profession. Isla and international librarianship, Anglo-Nordic library relationships, international influences in Thailand. So you can see that there are relationships there. There's reciprocity. There's learning. There's a why. There's a there's going to be some kind of like um, benefit to the profession of this examination. It's not simply descriptive. There's no exoticism. There's no study of the other or the foreign. It's really trying to kind of come up with deeper insights and, and, and explanations. So one of the quotes I like from Laura is that he says, I've long felt that there is more to international librarianship than description of librarianship in other countries. That yes, this is the kind of work before you that we want, want to see, that there, there, that there's something greater we should be aiming for, that it can't be one directional. There has to be relationships. There has to be um, some, some outcomes for the, the profession. What is IL? So misconception. I was thinking maybe I should have started with misconceptions and then went into the definition. But I start with the definition, then I talk about misconceptions. A lot of students in my courses, um, uh, this is kind of an aha for them. I say, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I thought I was going to be doing. So many librarians mistakenly think of international librarianship as a way of helping libraries in developing countries, like a kind of charity work. Like the response, say, you know, uh, after after Haiti and the earthquake and ALA had that influx of um, money and support into Haiti, that's great work. It's an, it's needed work, uh, but it's an emergency response, right? It's not it's it's filling a, a an immediate need, but it's not contributing to the development of the profession. Um, there's a one way there's a one way to this this a one direction um, in the relationship from the 
the rich country to the poor country. American librarians also sometimes confuse it to mean librarianship in other countries and think they don't need it because they're so large. So in the USA, the word international is commonly used to mean from another country. But in British English, by comparison, they would call that foreign. What is not American in the U.S. is considered international, so it's the studying of other people. But in fact, international really means working together. There is this relationship. So there can be that confusion, confusion I think, in the U.S. Um, I think a lot of smaller countries, it's just natural for them to collaborate and, and uh be working across borders by necessity, they're smaller, they, they have to do that. But at times I think that that we in the U.S. can not see the need to look outside and to collaborate outside our, our immediate geography. Okay, so why do we do IL? That's a good question. Why are we doing it? Um, we're doing it because we're a global profession, you know, even though we're supporting libraries locally, we, ha we have a lot of things in common. There are some things, um, we're all, we have similar issues, similar questions we're asking, and some of our answers will be specific to our local community, but some of our answers are going to be transferable across the community. So it's just useful for being able to learn and borrow from one another. As I wrote here, many interests and issues in librarianship transcend national boundaries from information policy, kind of information policy you can see there, e-resources, access, archiving, metadata standards, certainly we need that interoperability of, 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 uh, of standards if we all have our own local standards, nothing's talking to each other. Public services, too, there are issues, you know, right now you think of um, refugee communities and things like this, it's a, it's a common topic across the world. Um, indigenous, the indigenous people and um, addressing some of the inequities that libraries have perpetuated to help to help perpetuate historically. That is also a very common topic in many countries, so we can learn from each other. In fact, I think Shanice will remember maybe reading from uh, our course readings that the kind of work they're doing in Australia and New Zealand with respect to indigenous people and in, in the library, library services is amazing. Far ahead of anything that's happening here, I think, in the U.S. or in Canada. So we can learn from other people. And it's also useful and often necessary that we cooperate and collaborate to share practices um, and strengthen our, our profession globally. If we didn't have an IFLA, we, for example, with all the library associations sitting together saying, let's talk about what we believe, let's issue policy statements we all endorse, what is our common vision for libraries? What do we agree upon? And if they didn't go to these bodies like the UN, WIPO, WTO, we wouldn't have a voice there at these important conversations. So, so we need to be talking with each other and collaborating with each other. And, and all of this great work IFLA does, you know, in like putting out guidelines about what does it mean to be a public librarian? What does it mean to be a school librarian? These are things we're saying we agree upon. So we make our profession stronger. We make our profession stronger by doing so. <clears throat> and we have a long history of doing it, so we've always cooperated transnationally. Um, it's it's not a new thing, but it's just accelerated, I think, in the last you know 30, 40 years because of technology development and their internet. It's eased our ability to work across borders, work across time zones. Um, so it's definitely not not a novel practice to be doing international librarianship. It's just open it up more opportunities for people to get involved and do it. Some of the questions that when I think call pure, the, the pure or pinnacle pursuits of international librarianship, some of the questions we might seek to answer, again, think, keeping in mind that definition of field of activity, relationships, reciprocity, and there's librarians involved. These are the kind of questions that IL scholars kind of are seeking to answer. Things like what commonalities exist in our profession on a global scale? Can we, tr what experiences can be translated across geographical boundaries? Um, and if so, which ones can be generalized or adapted to other contexts and how, how so? How do librarians in different cultures with different values pursue internationally identified goals and objectives? What political, economic, and social factors promote or inhibit a healthy library environment? And what areas should we collaborate on or prioritize? 
So these are some of the kind of questions that IELTS scholars are seeking to uh, answer. But not everybody is going to be doing scholarly work like that. Um, in fact, Lohr, always get back to Lohr, then, he posits that there are a lot of different motivations or reasons why people might get involved um, in the international librarianship and publishing in the area. And um, a lot of our IL publishing right now and work is down at sort of those lower tiers of this continuum you can see here, national influence, philanthropy, and exoticism. And those tend to be more descriptive, um, anecdotal, a little more self-interest there, so we have less reciprocity, less collaborating, maybe not as introspective or evaluative, right? Um, and I think that that is a, those lower tiers actually are perfectly legitimate entry places to do international librarianship when you're starting out as a librarian um, or practitioner doing so. Uh, it takes some time to build up your knowledge base, your network, um, get those experiences under your belt that you might feel more comfortable to go out and, and approach a person and begin to genuinely partner with them around some shared goals. So it's not, um, we, I think a lot of our professional work is at those lower tiers. Tiers, if you do do this, a search in LAS database, you will find there's a lot of, you know, I went abroad, let me describe countries here or there. And what we want to do is just kind of try to push that more and get more of that kind of work and publishing at those at those upper tiers. That's what we're really aiming for. We can do more than just simply describe. Um, we can do things that can actually um, really help the profession globally. But at the same time, that doesn't, um, we don't want to delegitimize that starting at those lower tiers is perfectly natural. Like that's just where you're going to do it until you learn to cut your teeth, you know. You might join the ALA uh, <laughs> World Listserv and, and, be, and just listen to what people are talking about. It doesn't mean you have to start talking. You can be there on the periphery of that community until you start to get more comfortable and then you can start to take on more and more. So those are pretty, pretty um, those are really legitimate entry points into doing international librarianship, in my opinion. I just like this because I think I think a lot of time we just kind of cut the, 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 the hierarchy off and sort of aimed for those lower tiers and didn't realize that we could be more ambitious with our international librarianship work. And it kind of looks like Bloom's taxonomy or levels of evidence. You can see that, right, the evaluative and analytical components higher up in the hierarchy. But definitely when I started off doing um, international librarianship, and let me go back to that slide, and um, with Librarians Without Borders, I would never say, I don't think there actually is that much um, exoticism that drives librarians. I think that librarians genuinely are more are smarter than that <laughs> in terms of their publishing. I think we have more philanthropic sort of um, Motive. I think philanthropy is often the point in which we enter the hierarchy, and it definitely was for me. When, when I served with Librarians Without Borders 12 years ago, it was because there was a fellow that I was a TA with. I have a master's in linguistics, too, and he had a master's in anthropology. We were, I was doing my MLAS. We were, we were um, uh, TAing an interlinguistics course together, and he was from Angola and kept asking me all these questions about libraries. I thought it was very strange. People don't usually ask so many questions about libraries. Um, and then it turns out he was trying to build a library in his hometown in Mambo, Angola, where they didn't have any libraries at all for the medical students. So for me, my entry point was definitely in uh, at the philanthropy tier. And there's, there's some ratings I still have and things I published back then that I think reflect that. Um, but definitely over the years, I've, I'd like to think that I'm, you know, I'm, my my work has become more complex and introspective and, and I've, I've developed too, but it takes some time. So this is um, not a real quiz. <laughs> this is a quiz question. Again, I would go back to Shanice. She might remember it <laughs> um, from the course. You guys, you're not going to get any points for this, so you can't use this as evidence, I think, in your e-portfolios. But it's just an opportunity for you want to take a moment and reflect on this based upon what I said. Imagine that you're a collection development librarian at a college, and one of your areas of responsibility is to collect work in Asian studies. This is an, this, that would be considered international librarianship, collecting works from other regions. 
But how could you make your work a little more IL? How could you move it into that realm of international librarianship? So which of these activities below, just take a minute on your own to read it, and do you think kind of moves your work along from that sort of observer of things into a more active role? I'll give you guys a minute to think about it. Okay, Shanice got it right about the saying that um, this is a previous comment, there's no collaboration with the book drives, right? It's not a bad thing. I mean, it's filling a legitimate need doing so, but it is an international librarianship. It's something else. It's a charitable act. Yeah, so it looks like you guys have, a few people have chimed in. So representing, let's see, representing the the, the the Asian, African, Middle Eastern section of, of ACRL and ISLA, definitely getting involved with the international organization like that and going to those meetings and participating in discussions. That's moving your work from that more observer status into a more active role. Um, developing a formal relationship with an Asian librarian to exchange information. You can see how that would be. There's cross borders. There's um, a relationship with some some kind of goals, uh, there's reciprocity. Participating in a staff exchange, yes, that is another example. Um, I think presenting at an IFLA conference, too, is another way to move your work along. The two that I don't see as, 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 as pushing the international librarianship work further are launching a professional blog to write about your collection development work. Um, and just simply joining the Asian, African, and Middle Eastern section of ACRL. That might be joining the section, and again, as I was talking about the ALA World Listserv, joining that, that section in ACRL and just listening to the conversations is a great way to get started. And then maybe you're going to take on more and more roles, and then eventually you'll serve as the representative of that section to, to IFLA, which is a much more active role. So hopefully you can see that there are some that are that are just, they, they have all of those things we talked about, field of activity, relationship, reciprocity, those are key. How do you do, how do we do IL? There's a, there's a range of activities you can, you can do on small scale or on a large scale. Um, definitely joining like an IFLA committee like we talked about, uh, any kind of exchanges you can go on, sister library initiatives you can get involved in. Volunteering for an INGO, an international um, uh, nonprofit organization, like I just read there, like like Brooms of Borders, or sometimes World Reader. If some of you are in the Bay Area, I don't know if you know World World Reader, they distribute e-readers globally. Um, they have a librarian who leads their collection development, and they do they have these volunteer drives sometimes to help apply metadata. I think that can qualify too as I as, as, as an IL activity. So some kind of study that you would do that might have an international dimension, uh, like those ones that we talked about earlier. Um, and even networking, which is much more informal. There isn't, maybe there isn't literally hard-coded outcomes other than I want to learn more about librarianship review where you are and, and, and you want to learn more about with librarianship here and maybe we can exchange our ideas around something. So that can qualify too. In the prior teaching of the, of my course, um, there used to be a group called International Librarians Network. So some of you may have heard of them, the ILN. They did great stuff where they would be paired up with people. Shanice didn't get to do that because, unfortunately, the ILN disbanded. Um, I'm just sorry, I just was got distracted by this. <laughs> unfortunately, the ILN gets disbanded because one of the challenges of doing an international librarianship organization is funding. It's a super small funding. There's not a lot of money, so it's it's definitely challenging to keep something going. But I can see that being a way that you could um, 
you know, earn evidence towards your competency. Oh, in my international librarianship class, we did have assignment that, and she needs to do this, where they just, you just had to find somebody to network in your realm of interest internationally. There you go. So you can go to IFLA, International Federation Library Association, or SLA International, look at their sections, get on a listserv, see if you can talk to somebody and have a few exchanges with them and learn more from, from them, and that could serve um, probably, to, I, I would think, as evidence towards competency. Oh, don't quote me on that because I'm not an e-portfolio uh, mentor, but I'm going to ask Sandy and uh, Linda about that and get back to you guys, but you can't ask your own mentors. So there's lots of ways you can do these things. And there's lots of different pairings or, or ways to get involved with other individuals. You might be, with networking is a one-on-one -on -one thing, um, but there's lots of different pairings of, 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 of parties. Like ALA with IFLA on a shared initiative is an example of um, doing international librarianship. You can work with individual with, a, with IFLA through a committee work or a conference presentation. Um, two scholars working together, we just talked about that. Sister libraries through workplace institutions, that's another way. So there's lots of different pairings. It doesn't have to be two large organizations. It can be at the individual level, too. Some celebrity doers. So there's some great people that um, if you follow along on their Twitter or uh, their blogs, you can learn from. Um, I'm dialed more into the academic and public world, not so much special libraries. So I'm sure there are gaps here, so sorry about that. But uh, there's uh, Peter Lohr, obviously. You know, I'm a, a huge fan, so you can look up his work. Uh, Jan Holmquist, who is like the Scandinavian librarian, who's simply awesome. So I would, he, he is truly a global librarian and publishes a lot on that. Great guy to follow. Lloyda Garcia Febo, who you know is the ALA incoming president, so she's a great person to follow. Uh, Barbara Ford and Claire Chu at the Morton, Morton Center at the University of Illinois Champaign, They're, they do some great work. And as I mentioned before, like you could start to simply follow these organizations to learn more about them through social media or get on a listserv. You don't even have to be an IFLA member to join the listserv, because joining IFLA, you know, is cost prohibitive. It's not cheap, but the listservs are are open for anyone, so you don't need to pay to access those listservs. Um, see with ALA World. I'm not an ALA member currently, but I'm on the ALA World listserv, so that's not an issue. That's a way that I keep, you know, abreast of things that are happening. So um, I give some other examples. There's like IBI, the International Books for Young People, International Association for School Libraries. There is, if you look in Wikipedia for international for library associations, you're going to see there are tons of international library associations. Practically one for every interest you may have. International Association of Music Libraries, International Association of I don't even know. We'll just keep going. There, are, there's lots of them. So, and remember, you might not be ready right now to do some sort of uh, reciprocal project yet with uh, with another colleague in another country, but you can start by just simply learning and listening and reading, and that's a great way to get involved. And I would think that's also could be a great way to start getting some some evidence um, for your portfolios. Let's see. So some parting remarks for doing IL. Um, remember again that it's not the study of others; it's not the study of foreign. Um, it's a field of activity, and it's an in intentional relationship with shared interests and goals between two or more nations, and then there are librarians there. So we just begin to eliminate this idea of book donations being IL. Internalize the idea of that, that, con that continuum of motivations and try to get beyond purely descriptive or charitable work. Understand that there's lots of different people that are doing IL, lots of different pa pairings, and lots of different ways to contribute. And appreciate, this is one I can't underscore enough, that your entry into the field may be observational at first, and then with time you'll develop expertise at those higher tiers. Um, I think for those of you, I was listening before we go to Q&A, like that you're concerned you don't have evidence yet, and you're not sure if your upcoming courses um, will have it or not, I think you can always try and seek to internationalize your, your, your assignment yourself. So maybe there's a way that you could take on a global perspective. Like if you're asked to do a research paper on X, can you, can you take it global, go beyond the US, see if that could fit. So you may have to take that initiative yourself within your own courses, or I think there's some really great ideas in the chat box from um, networking or 
um, maybe you'll be able to take a MOOC or something like this that you might be able to, um, to use towards evidence of your international competency. So that is the, um, the end of my talk. It's kind of like if you, if you're in the high school for a few semesters or a year or so, and this, my international librarianship course are probably taught again, I think, next fall. So you, you can always just wait it out because I think like she needs, you won't have to worry about anything. You'll get your international competency all covered. Um, for, the, for the rest of you, definitely talk with your, your ePortfolio mentors about different kind of evidence you might be able to use. And I'll ask Sandy and, and Linda for some ideas as well. Um, but that's it for me, Shanice, then, I think. There's a little bit of a crash course in international librarianship, and hopefully it was interesting and not confusing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, yeah, you're welcome. If you guys have any questions, feel free to um, type them in the chat box. Don't be afraid to grab the mic, too. If you have a question, feel free to just uh, go ahead and voice it. Well, I'm happy for you to have the slides if Shanice wants to post them somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you want to share your um, email, I can definitely send it to you. What projects do I sign? You mean in my current course, the Global Libraries uh, Project Program? Well, 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 tongue twister there. Uh, I, right now, there are four project areas, and so it always works out relatively good that I managed to get people interested in each area. So one is, um, oh gosh, what am I having to bring them? Collection development with no budget, because most of our libraries that Librarians Without Borders work with um, don't have the money for collection development, so we're like looking at how, what are ways that we can augment the collections. There's one on assessing library services to help the libraries get into that um, assessment culture that can help them with grant applications and just in improving their own practice because most of the librarians we work with don't have any formal MLIS training. As I mentioned earlier, most of the world, it's not that normal. So we're looking at them to help develop like those skills. Um, there's one on cataloging and uh, cataloging ILS automation. Um, because the libraries are small and they're getting beyond like uh, keeping simple ledgers of their books to wanting to circulate, but they don't need these fully featured, crazy, you know, uh, ILSs like we have here in the U.S. So we're looking at like open source kind of stuff. And then the last one is training program development. Again, Shanice will know that I'm sort of big on this because um, our colleagues internationally, they need some support and more PD training because they're not getting access to it um, in the countries in which they live. Like in Guatemala, they really don't have much of a library association. It's just a library association in the, in, in the capital city that supports um, academic librarians, and it doesn't get out into the countryside. It doesn't serve public librarians or school librarians. They're just left to their own with no means to network or PD. So there's four projects, and great, and uh, we have students in all four project areas, so everyone managed to get their different interests covered, so it works well. So it was a long answer. But they're derived from real community needs. That's the, the point of the class, is they're really getting to know as much as they can from a distance and in a short time, the Guatemalan community, and working on projects that really are derived from real community needs, and, to, and writing white papers that help them. Um, come up with proposed solutions. Yeah, you're welcome, Rachel. See, Melanie, there's question. a question in there from uh, Janice asking, do you see more virtual libraries becoming international libraries? Do you see more virtual libraries becoming international libraries? I'm not sure I understand that question. Hmm. Janice, if you want to clarify, feel free to grab hmm. that mic. And Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I was thinking about, for example, a special library like the Ecology of Life uh, <laughs> Library or the Biological Diversity Heritage Library of them becoming more global across borders and becoming more of a virtual international library. 
And I was wondering like if you were people seeing people contribute into it. Yeah, from from different countries. Yeah. Well, that even like speaks to say um, like open access, right? Like you know the open access journals and things like that. Um, there's still a challenge. Like it's it's great for people for for librarians to be able to publish more easily, but there's still barriers to doing so from like the technology to do it, um, the technical skills, internet connection. So I think it I think it, it could be the case, but it's not without its challenges. Like it just opening it up, it, it, there's all these other kind of resource challenges for the librarians. And time challenges too. A lot of them work, you know, in small libraries. They don't have, they're not tenure, you know, academic librarians. I know this because I was academic librarian on site, and it's a sweet, it was a sweet deal in the sense that you have time for scholarship and service in addition to your librarian duties. But our colleagues abroad, they often, you know, don't have that that's the same opportunity to do so. So they're they're challenged by like. Um, by the, by resources and small staff. So in theory, yeah, I mean, virtual libraries absolutely could, but just putting the invite out there, it's still challenging, right? It's still challenging to to get the the contributions in. I think. Thank you. You're welcome. The yeah, open access was like, uh, did you be spending time learning about open access and? Um, Look at some of the geography about who contributes. There still is a lot. The global south is not contributing at the same pace as, as the north, for, for lots of the reasons I mentioned. But it's a starting place. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, if there aren't any more questions, we will definitely, um, if anyone's having, I guess, trouble to uh, downloading, we can definitely send it your, uh, the PowerPoint your way. Melanie, do you have an email or a preferred method of contact that people can get to you out if they do have questions in the future? Yeah, you can email me at, um, that email address right there, melanie.sellergmail.com. Thank you. You're welcome. It's interesting as well for me to hear from you guys um, that you're struggling a little bit about how to satisfy that competency. I don't know if you've experienced similar tr troubles with the other ones, or is this one especially tricky? Just curious. I think in general a lot of people find this competency to be a little trickier um, than the rest. I know I personally have heard not only from professor, you know, from, from classmates but from other professors uh, that this can kind of be the competency that, that trips people up. So um, okay. this is some great information for everybody to think about and to mm -hmm. continue uh, the conversation. Sorry, my dog just said to go crazy. Um, <laughs> But yeah, this is a great way to continue the conversation. And uh, I would just like to ask, you know, Melanie, when you get those answers back from Dr. Hirsch um, and from Linda, if you would let us know, because following this, we're going to try to do a, a little bit of a follow-up blog post um, about the event. And I think it'd be really nice to get the answers to some of those questions um, in that blog post, just so that everybody can see them. Okay. That's yeah, absolutely. No, not a problem. And. Um, Maybe I should. I might need to do my PD workshop again for faculty about how to internationalize their courses. <laughs> Maybe time for a refresher. Hi, this is Dana, and that's that was my question. I my understanding was that the courses were supposed to have sort of an international element included in them, and some of them it's obvious. Some of us you, you could see a particular lesson or something has to do more with international librarianship, but mm -hmm. some of them, if it's there, it's kind of hard to find. So, so they don't I declare it for that, you. That, yeah, that's what makes it tough. Is people, it's a newer, it's a newer mm -hmm. comp. Um, it's kind of outside of the standard of the other comps. It looks different. It feels different. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes the lesson pieces are sort of not really obvious in the classes. Right. 
Yeah. Well, it might help them for them to declare it. Like this is a comp, you could use this for competency oath. Is that something that would be help, helpful and you see for other competencies or are you usually left to sort of figure that out for yourself? Right. For example, Dr. D, who's our advisor for this group, I know with her 204 classes, mm -hmm. she has us do a little bit about a sister library and wraps that international kind of component into one of her assignments. So That's you great. can see it there. Yeah. But I'm not sure if all of the 204 instructors do that. So. Right, right. Okay, good to know. Thank you. I also find that sometimes it's not integrated that well into the coursework, so it just kind of feels like it's tacked on um, just because they, you know, have to fulfill that um, the need, and it, it just feels a little bit awkward. It's mm. not integrated well, then. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hearing the feedback. So one thing I would just like to, to ask from any participants of things, if you have any ideas or comments about our event tonight, any questions, anything like that, feel free to email any of us on the executive committee. I'll put my email down at the bottom. Um, you know, if you have some quotes or something that you'd like to give us about your um, impressions of the, the evening's event, please let us know. We'd love to get those input into our um, our blog post for our debrief of the event. Um, and so please feel free to reach out to us for, for any reason. Thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to speak tonight. It's nice to have a, have a live event with students. Good luck with your courses. Thank you. Yes, thanks again. Before everyone goes, I uh, want to remind everyone that we have another um, guest speaker. Um, is it November the 7th? If you can, please make your way back to the group. Um, we'll be talking to Dr. Steven, uh, Michael Stevens, demystifying conferences. Um, it'll be another good um, presentation and it may be a little bit earlier so um, just look out for um, emails from the iSchool and our you know our website and our social media um, should have that information as to time when it comes oh 630 it's at 630 just seen it all right great All right, thank you everyone. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off the recording now.